I should start by kind of saying right at the start, that I'm not a biologist. I'm kind of not even a mathematical biologist. I'm a, a statistician. Um, and I work typically on Bayesian computation problems and uncertainty quantification problems. Um, and I happen to get involved in this project uh, when approached by Richard Clayton and Stephen Niederer. So it's a, a big kind of applied um, problem across multiple sites. Um, what we're trying to do is uncertainty quantification for patient specific cardiac models. So the Steve Nieder is, is the PI of the project, uh, myself, Jeremy and Richard are the co-eyes and the postdocs who've done most of the work here. Uh, are Sam Coveney, who's done a lot of the work I'm going to talk about, Cesare Corrado, Caroline Roney and Orod Orazegui. So because I'm not a statistician, uh, because I'm not a biologist, I'm prone to say daft things about uh, the biology at times, so I apologise for that. I think the last time I talked about this was uh, at the Newton Institute uh, last year, and I was talking to a bunch of cardiologists and heart modellers, and I had various pictures, uh, I was talking about atrial fibrillation, and I, was, I was told afterwards that the pictures I had on screen were actual, actually ventricles, not atria, and this apparently is a terribly embarrassing mistake to make. But to me, I, 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 you know, the, the, the biological details not um, what I'm going to be strong on here. It's not important. I'm talking about the kind of the, the statistical modeling and the uncertainty quantification side of things. I should also apologise. We're in the process of moving house at the moment, so there's, the room's full of boxes behind me. So that's why it's such a tip. Okay. So this is uh, about the heart. Okay. So if you know nothing about the heart, I don't know the people's backgrounds here, but you can think of it as an electromechanical pump. So think of it as a bag that contains blood okay, and electrical waves start somewhere on this bag okay, and the wave then spreads out over the surface of the heart and causing the muscle to contract pumping blood. And we're going to focus in particular on the left atrium. Okay, so the left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the lungs, pumps it into the ventricle that then gets pumped around the rest of the body. And the left atrium is important because it is where various problems that can occur in arrhythmias uh, originate quite often. So we're interested in something called atrial fibrillation. Okay. So remember I said the heart's an electrical pump. Okay. And what should happen in a functioning well is that a wave starts somewhere on the surface of the heart and it spreads smoothly around the heart, causing it to contract in a coordinated way. When atrial fibrillation occurs, we get uncoordinated, kind of rapid uh, firing of the heart tissue, and this kind of leads to poor mechanical function. So I've got a simulation that uh, Richard Clayton created here. So this is of a rabbit ventricle. Okay. And this is uh, a, a, in fibrillation here. So instead of getting smooth um, electrical waves spreading across the surface of the heart, you've got these kind of random looking uh, patterns that appear. So on the left, you've got the uh, electrical activation on the surface of the heart. Um, in the center, it's in the, in, in, you can see the interior of the tissue. On the right, you've got kind of li the lines of base singularity around which the rotating waves rotate. Okay, so this is atrial fibrillation. Although well, this is ventric ventricular fibrillation, but we're interested in atrial fibrillation. So this affects between about 600,000 and a million people in the UK at present. And one way in which it's treated is by a catheter ablation. Okay. So a, a surgeon in a cath lab will, will uh, pass an electrode through uh, an artery in your groin, have any groin, onto the surface of your heart, okay, and put electrodes on the surface of the heart, and then they will uh, do ablation marks, which are think of them as burns on the surface of the heart. And those burns uh, isolate or remove pathological tissue, okay? They break up the waves, they don't conduct electricity, so you think of them as putting them in positions to try and stop these erroneous waves. Well, fortunately, when we do this, about 40% of the patients who are treated for atrial fibrillation go on to have a secondary condition called atrial tachycardia. Okay, so a fibrillation is uncoordinated beating, tachycardia is fast beating. So what we want to do is can we predict which of the fibrillation patients will subsequently go on to develop atrial tachycardia after an ablation? So we want to think about how is the atrial tachycardia going to happen? What are the electrical pathways in the heart that will allow it to happen? 
And then potentially you know, where we want to get to is guiding the surgeon to treat for both conditions at the same time. So as they're treating to, to cure the fibrillation, to predict how the tachycardia will occur and to try and predict both. And the reason we want to treat them both at the same time is that each intervention has a cost and a risk. There's about a 6% chance of something horrible going wrong every time you have one of these uh, procedures. And the way we're going to do this is by, uh, by uh, kind of personalized biophysical models. So uh, computer simulations of individual patients' hearts. So these are the kind of things that mathematical modelers build, people like Richard Clayton uh, and Steve Niederer. And they're based on kind of partial differential equations that describe how electrical waves move. Now, at the moment, all these models tend to be um, deterministic, but they all rely upon knowing a large amount about each individual patient. You need to know the shape of that atrium. You need to know the tissue properties uh, of uh, the, the, the heart material for each patient and so on. Okay? You know where the scar tissue is, any diseased regions of the heart. And so in order to use mathematical models to predict well, we need to be able to infer all these different unknowns. We need to know about the tissue properties. We need to know about the atrial manifold shape and so on. So that's the, the kind of outline of the project. What we're going to try and do is build, to use a jargon, a digital twin of the patient, or think about this as a computer model of a patient. I'm going to do that by combining kind of three sources of information. On the one hand, we're going to have physics, physiology, so computer models, mathematical models. So this is where you know, people like yourselves have built uh, realistic mathematical models of electric activation in the heart. We're then going to use the prior knowledge we have from um, having treated previous patients. So we've got lots of measurements and recordings from lots of different uh, atrial fibrillation patients in the past. Can we build that, to, can we use that information to build up a prior distribution for the population? And finally, we're going to have individual measurements for a given, um, sorry, for a given patient. We're going to, you know, a new patient comes in, we're going to take measurements of them. We're going to want to combine these three things to form a patient-specific digital twin. And then what we eventually want to be able to do is to get, use this digital twin to guide uh, clinical interventions, to, do, to guide treatment. And I guess a key aspect to our, all of this is how confident are we in our predictions? You know, where, where is the uncertainty? Can we reduce uncertainty sufficiently to make recommendations uh, that would be trustworthy. Okay, so the kind of things um, we're gonna do, we're gonna use a complex simulator to simulate the electrical activation patterns. And to do that, we need to know something about the geometry of the heart, the tissue properties of the heart, diseased regions and so on. And all of these are gonna be unknown. And so the question is how we can answer these, estimate these things in order to do and uh, create a decent simulation of an individual patient. So this is kind of going to be our workflow that we're, we're working towards. Patient comes in, we start off with a, an MRI scan of their heart, and that's going to allow us to estimate what their heart looks like, okay, what the shape of their atrium is. Possibly we'll be able to do things like identify regions of fibrosis, fibrotic regions. So that's where diseased regions where the tissue becomes uh, stiff and doesn't conduct as well. Then we're going to have um, the electrophysiology study. So when they go into a procedure, they're going to have measurements taken on the surface of their heart. Okay, we're, going to, we're going to learn about how the waves uh, propagate. We're going to try and interpolate these, um, these electrical um, timings we have to the entire surface. From there, we're going to estimate conduction velocities. From there, we're going to estimate tissue properties. And from there, we're going to try and do simulations to kind of try and uh, guide procedures. And what we're going to want to try and do is track uncertainty all the way through these stages. Okay? In each stage, we have limited noisy observations, and we're going to want to try and um, keep track of all those uncertainties as we go. Okay, 
So just to, to break down a little bit about what we're going to do here, there's an event we want to predict the probability of. So we want to predict, for example, the probability of a patient suffering from atrial tachycardia after a particular surgical intervention, after a particular ablation. Okay. We want to predict that probability on the basis of some data. So where we're going to break the, the calculation down is into um, the probability of the event if we knew all the parameters, all the, all the uh, uh, properties uh, rela uh, relating to that individual patient. So there are things like the tissue parameters, theta, the shape of the patient, atria, x. Um, we'll ignore f for a minute. And the way we do that prediction, we're going to marginalize out our uncertainty in these quantities. So that's the, the uh, so we've got the probability of the event if we knew those quantities, but we don't know those quantities. So we've got our posterior distribution for those quantities. Okay. So that's our belief about the tissue properties theta, the, the atrial shape X, given the measurements we have. We're going to integrate over those uncertainties. So what we need here is to work out our posterior distribution over these parameters. So again, to break it down, our posterior distribution of these parameters is going to be our prior distributions over them. So these are things we learn from the uh, population of patients. So what do we expect the population to have in terms of tissue properties? What do we expect the population to have in terms of their atrial manifold, their geometry? Okay. Then the link between them and the data is via our, our physics simulator, our complex model. Okay, so our model is going to tell us, you know, if the tissue properties were theta, if the shape was x, what's the probability of seeing the data? So we're going to use that and by Bayes' theorem to get our posterior distribution, combine it with a forward prediction, and trying to get probabilities. So that's where we're trying to head towards. But to get there, there's lots of bit, parts to solve. We've got to find these priors. We've got to specify this likelihood. We've got to work out how to do this computation, work out how to do this integral, and so on. So, so it's breaking down this problem into its constituent parts. Okay. So I should just say that you know we're forced to take a very pragmatic approach here. The, the tissue properties are spatially resolved parameters. Okay. For each location on the heart, there's different cells. Each cell conduct uh, electricity uh, in the waves with, um, to different extents. Okay, so we're going to have these tissue properties resolved. So we've got these different surfaces of parameters to infer with really limited amounts of information. So we're going to have to reduce the dimension, do crude kind of things to try and get some limited handle on uncertainties. And so that's what I'm going to talk about here, how we do some of these things and to make a first pass at these problems. Okay, so I'll break it down into two or three different problems, depending on how much time we have, and talk about each one. So first of all, uh, this is some work by uh, Cesare Ledon, was published last year in Medical Image Analysis. And we were interested in inferring the shape of someone's atrium from an MRI scan of atrium. So, of course, when someone has a, a scan of their heart, it's moving all the time. Okay, so these things are not easy to uh, record. The measurements are noisy. Okay. So what we get is a noisy set of observations of what the true atrial shape is. Okay, so we can think of the observations as being the truth plus a noise term. And we want to characterize, we want to learn what the true shape is and characterize the uncertainty in that so that when we do simulations, we can propagate through our uncertainty about the true shape into our predictions. So the question is, how can we kind of parsimoniously or simply describe the variation in these atrial shapes? So what we're going to try and do here is change to a different basis, a low dimensional basis that describes the variation in a small number of coordinates. So we're going to try and write our data as some mean shape, this is the kind of average shape for the population, plus a small number of coordinates, d coordinates, lambda i here, times by these kind of basis directions that describe the variation in atrial shape for the population, okay. plus the noise term. So what we're going to want to try and find out is this reduced basis, 
So the vectors U, okay. The error variance for the MRI uh, system we're using, okay. And then a prior distribution for the coordinates for the population. Okay. So we have data on a, a small, well, a few hundred patients from KCL, and we're gonna try and use these MRI scans to learn these things. Okay. Then when we come along with data for a, a given patient, a scan for a given patient, we're going to be able to work out what our posterior distribution is for their atrial shape, given their particular observations, okay. using the prior we've learned for the population and uh, the model we've, um, the kind of reduced dimensional model we've got here. Okay. Now, of course, you know, we know that the way to do this is using critical component analysis, um, a a Carhern and Lure type basis expansion is going to be the optimal approach here for capturing the most variation we can. Okay. So it's kind of a, a fairly well known solution to this uh, problem here. But this doesn't give us a workflow um, to allow us to quickly, for each new patient, go from a prior distribution for the population, take the measurement for that new patient, and get an updated mean and variance for a given patient. And then when we do simulations, we're going to do simulations of things like the electrical wave spreading out, instead of just getting a single answer for a single geometry for the, the, the speed and the, sh uh, the shape of the waveform as it spreads around the heart, we can get um, an expected value and uncertainty in those simulations. So just by considering the uncertainty and the shape, we go from a deterministic kind of simulation to a, a simulation where we've got uncertainty in our simulated values. And, and the, the amount of uncertainty varies depending upon where you are on the atrium. Okay. So that's how, how we're gonna think about in, incorporating shape uncertainty, the uncertainty atria. The next thing we're gonna get is measurements of the activation time, okay? so. I'm going to talk about uh, LAT a lot, local activation time. And as I said, you can think of um, the heart as a surface where the waves spread over that surface. So in this picture here, the blue represents inactive cardiac tissue, and the red is where the wave is currently. That's the active cardiac tissue. And this red wave spreads around the surface of the heart, and we're going to want to know at what time, sorry, at what time the red the wave arrives at each location. And that's gonna allow us to estimate how fast the wave is moving, how fast its activation time moves. So we get measurements of these things in electrophysiology studies. So we get uh, electrodes put onto the surface of the heart, a small number of locations, have I got a picture? Yep, so we get a small number of locations on the heart. And what we measure is the electrical activity at each point. And from that, we're going to be able to say when it is that the wave gets to each of these locations. And from that, we want to infer what the wave did over the entire atrium. Okay, so we want to infer the wave shape of the entire um, atrial manifold. Okay. So let me just check the time. So the first thing, the first difficulty we have is that just determining when the wave gets to a point in, in a clean, uh, repeatable way turns out to be quite difficult, particularly for patients suffering with atrial fibrillation. So what you get from um, these electrophysiology studies are electrocardiograms. Okay? So these look like waves like the lines in the background here. Okay? And the types of waves you get are quite varied. Okay, so sometimes you get these uniphasic waves, sometimes you get these biphasic waves, triphasic, or you get all kinds of uh, mess. Okay, so the first thing we had to do was find a, a a way we could automate the processing of these signals to determine when activation actually occurred and uncertainty in it. Okay, so. I mean, you can refer to the paper um, for, the, for the details, but um, these signals are often very clipped, there's often missing data. Uh, and so using any of the kind of pre-existing definitions from literature, so like the peak here or the, the maximum gradient is another 
point that's used it turned out to be quite difficult okay so we did a lot of pre-processing of the data to try and uh, in an automated way take lots of these car electrocardiograms and uh, estimate when the activation occurred with uncertainty So what that gives us is that each measurement location a time, okay? So the wave reached here after so many milliseconds, it reached here at another number of milliseconds and so on. What we're then gonna to want to do is interpolate these times over the surface of the atria, okay? And then work out the conduction velocity over the atrium. Okay, and from that conduction velocity, we're going to want to work out the tissue properties. So the, the first step is interpolation here on the atrium, okay, from this small number of measurements to all the locations. And this is the result in the background, um, the, the result of an inference procedure. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to do this by Gaussian processes. So I'm just going to spend a minute or two talking about Gaussian processes. Okay. So we're given data here that are, sorry, locations, which are X okay, on the manifold and times, which are called Y here. And we want to know the function that we, uh, says the time for a given location X. So one way of doing interpolation is by uh, Gaussian processes. So I don't, don't know how many people are familiar with Gaussian processes. It's kind of the difficult thing about giving seminars remotely is that it's hard to judge your audience, um, but you can, Think of Gaussian processes, they're just stochastic processes with some index X, such that if you consider any uh, collection of function values, okay, they have a Gaussian distribution. Okay. So they are just models of functions. Whereas if we think, well, when we think about the function at a number of locations, um, it has a Gaussian distribution. And the way we specify a Gaussian process model is via a mean function and a covariance function. And it's the covariance function that matters most for these models. The covariance function tells us, well, tells us the covariance between the function at two different locations. Okay, so it tells us the covariance between the uh, function at x and the function at x prime. And once we specify the covariance function, we specify the flavor or, or uh, of Gaussian process, like how rough it is, how smoothly it varies, and so on. Okay, so 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 why why Gaussian process is so widely used? Why are we going to rely upon them so heavily? Okay, there's kind of various answers to this question. Okay. But the kind of the main answer is that they're so mathematically tractable, if you like. Okay, so you can do lots of things to Gaussian processes, and they remain. Gaussian processes. So if you have two Gaussian processes and add them, it's another Gaussian process. Okay. The most important property is that they are closed under Bayesian conditioning. If you observe the process at a number of locations, and then you say, well, what do I now think about this function f? Given my observations, it's still a Gaussian process. So we started with a Gaussian process, we learned something about it, it's still a Gaussian process. And that's untrue for most of the processes, possibly all of them processes, right? It's closed under Bayesian conditioning. All that changes from our prior specification to our posterior specification here is we just change the mean and covariance functions in a, a fairly simple way. It's just a linear algebra expression for going from prior to posterior covariance. Okay. I won't give the details. The other nice thing about Gaussian processes, which is kind of a, a generalization of two above, is that they're closed under any linear operation. Okay. So for any linear operator, if F is a GP, then the linear operator applied to F is also a, a GP. So you can differentiate the Gaussian process and the derivative is still a Gaussian process. You can integrate it. So this is nice because we can write down differential equations, for example. In, uh, in, term, in a gas process in terms of differential equation, and we know that the, if it's a linear differential equation, we know that the answer will still be a Gaussian process. Okay. So it gives us a nice way, a uh, nice tra tractable family of functions to work with. Okay. Uh, 
So back to our problem. We want to interpolate the local activation time, the time the wave got to each point on the surface of the atria. And we want to do that as a function of the location X on the atria. Now I said that the covariance function is the key kind of component of Gaussian processes. And the way we typically write down covariance functions is we think of them uh, as um, a function of the Euclidean distance between points. Okay, so the covariance between f at x and f at x prime is typically just some function of the distance between x and x prime. And we have to choose from, well, we have to have k that is a positive definite function. And that's a, kind of a, a difficult requirement to check and um, meet. And so we tend to choose from a small, set of candidate models. Now the problem we have is that Euclidean distance here makes no sense for us. Our data lie on the surface of the heart. Okay. So the Euclidean distance between a point on one side and the point on another side is not a relevant distance. The wave has to travel on the surface of the heart. So we need a model that works with geodesic distances or, or distances along the surface. Okay, we can't use Euclidean distances. Okay. Now I said that the covariance functions need to be positive definite. And it turns out that writing down positive definite functions is really challenging. If you think about Gaussian processes on the sphere, there's lots of very technical papers describing how to do that. And a sphere is a really nice, clean object to work with. On the surface of a heart, which is kind of twisted and a strange shape, you can't hope to explicitly write down a valid covariance function. We just can't start with that view of things. Okay? So we have to approach the problem from a different direction. So the way we do things is via basis expansions of Gaussian processes. Okay, so if f is our function, we're going to think about f as a, a, a sum of basis functions, these phi i's, multiplied by random coefficients. Now, if we pick these coefficients to be Gaussian, independent Gaussian random variables, then we're going to have that f turns out to be a Gaussian process. Yeah, this is just a sum of Gaussians. So, and we can write down the covariance function here, okay? It's not, it's not hard to do, okay? The covariance function is just gonna be a sum of the variances of our coefficients times by um, our covariance function squared, essentially, okay? added up. So the challenge becomes, how do we pick good basis functions here? How do we find a good set of basis functions? Now, the way we normally think in Gaussian process literature is you start with the covariance function and you try to find the conv convenient basis expansion, but, but we can't do that here. Yeah? We can't start with k. We don't know how to write down a k. So we're going to start in the other direction. We're going to try and start with basis vectors and find good implicit covariance functions. Okay? We're not going to try and write down explicitly a basis function. Okay. So the way we started with this was with the, uh, the Inler SPDE approach. So people may have heard of this or not. This is um, really impressive work by Finn Lindgren and colleagues from about 2011. Okay. Uh, and they kind of uh, use this old connection uh, discovered by Whittle uh, between Gaussian processes and stochastic partial difference equations. Okay. So given a GP, given the Gaussian process, a certain type of GP anyway, with the Matern covariance, we can write it down as the stationary solution to a stochastic partial differential equation. Okay. They're equivalent ways of thinking about the same object. Okay, so th this is a Brownian motion here, white, white noise here. Okay. So the solution to this stochastic partial difference equation is a Gaussian process with Matern covariance. So once you think of this way, we can think about solving our problem in terms uh, of all the standard ways you solve PDEs, right? So we can use this using finite element kind of uh, methods to solve this. And the nice way about thinking in these terms is we can 
we can think about this equation on any domain we like. In particular, we can think about it on an on a irregular manifold, you know, an atrial manifold. Yeah? This equation makes sense when we think about um, an f of x defined on this uh, surface. So it gives us a way of thinking about Gaussian processes on irregular domains. Okay. So again, you know, this detail doesn't really matter here, but we, we, we can write down the, um, the, the, the process as a sort of basis functions and the finite element machinery is gonna tell us uh, how to infer these Ws, okay, the, the, the coefficients, and it will efficiently give us the posterior distribution of our interpolated surface. Sorry, I've mixed up F and lat here, haven't I? That should be, the lat and F are the same thing. Okay. So we could do this, it gives us, uh, the, you know, there's, there's nice software out there that allows us to do this without too much difficulty. Um, you tell it your, your, um, your, 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 your triangulated grid of points and uh, you, you, the, the software will um, allow you to do interpolation of these things. Okay. So let me just check the time. Okay. So the, the problem we found with this is that it was too limited for our purposes. This link between return covariance functions, um, well, this link here between PDEs and Gaussian processes only works for some classes of covariance function. And in particular, it's hard to get smooth functions f here. Okay. So when we fit it, the mean function looked okay to our things. But when we looked at random samples, we were getting samples that didn't look realistic. So the colors here represent a wave spreading across. And we get these blodgy patches here. So the wave was kind of getting here. So the yellow comes before the red, so you're getting here before it passed through the red period. So we're getting these kind of non-physical looking random samples. The problem with that is we want to differentiate these samples because we don't care about the activation time itself. We can care about the conduction velocity. So we needed a way of getting smoother functions here. So we switched approach um, to this really nice paper by uh, Solin and Sarka, okay, from last year. And they use a, a, another old kind of duality and a, 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 a different way of thinking about Gaussian processes. They use this duality between stationary covariance functions and spectral densities. Okay, so this is the wiener kinchin theorem. We know that any spatial covariance function can be written as a Fourier transform of the spectral density and vice versa. So what we're going to try and do instead is instead of specifying a covariance function, which we know we can't do, we're going to specify a spatial, uh, a spectral density S that corresponds to a, a smoother family of Gaussian processes. So what um, Arno Solon and Simasaka did in their paper, they used a different basis expansion. They used that eigen basis that comes from uh, the Laplacian operator. So the eigenfunctions are the Laplacian here. Yeah? And they showed that if you write, uh, if you consider the function that is a, a random sum of these um, eigenfunctions, where the variances scale with the spectral density uh, of that um, applied to the eigenvalues, what you get is a Gaussian process that has the spectral density S, okay? So this is really nice, right? You've got an eigen base, uh, a basis expansion here that is nothing to do with the Gaussian process. Okay, this is just depends upon your domain and your Laplacian operator. Right? There's no mention of a Gaussian process here. Were well, they going to write a function in terms of these basis vectors, and the Gaussian process bit comes in through this spectral density here? When we do this, we get a Gaussian process that has whatever spectral density we re require. Okay. And in particular, because the spectral density doesn't depend upon the domain, you know, we can solve this eigenvalue problem 
on our atrial domain. If we, we can solve this on the surface of the heart. So we get functions that live on the surface of the heart. And when we add them up, we get a Gaussian process that is as smooth, you know, whatever Gaussian process we like by picking this spectral density. We can, and particularly, we can pick smooth Gaussian processes. The other nice thing to note about this paper, this, this is not my paper, this is the, the, the Solon and Sarka paper, okay, is that the covariance function here, um, again, has this property that it is this, the, the kind of a variance term times the eigen uh, functions. And the eigen functions, as I say, don't depend upon the Gaussian process specification. So they can be computed in advance. And they're expensive to compute. But when we want to estimate hyperparameters, all that changes in our equations is this term at the front here. Okay, so fitting these things uh, by changing hyperparameters and so on is very cheap because all we need to do is change um, the coefficients at the front. Okay. And again, what we're going to do, we're going to truncate this expansion. So, uh, you know, the original approximation was valid for an infinite sum here. Uh, we're just going to take the leading order terms, the most important terms in this sum. And this is going to give us a reduced rank, a low rank GP. So instead of trying to work in an, with an infinite dimensional thing, we're just going to uh, truncate to kind of M terms in here and work uh, with this small lower dimensional uh, set of unknowns. Okay, um, sorry, I got a bit lost there, didn't I? So I said before that what we, um, what, we're, what we observe are the local activation times, the time the wave spreads over the surface, but what we care about is the gradient of this surface, the, the velocity of it, if you like. So the nice thing about this uh, expansion, this Laplacian uh, expansion again, is that it allows us to explicitly work out the gradient, sorry, the gradient of our function. And it allows us to work out the distribution of the gradient as well. Okay. So we, we have a Gaussian process on a, a complex surface, and it's a Gaussian process where we can work out the gradient. So what this allows us to do is to infer the activation time, which is the colors in the background here, but it also allows us to work out the velocity. So that's the arrows, which are probably too small for you to see, but you can hopefully see these directions here. So you can work out the direction the wave's spreading as well. We get uncertainty in these quantities um, in addition. Okay. So here I've got the activation times and we get um, quite, so this is a synthetic example, I should say, we get quite small uncertainties here. So these are the activation times at the bottom is the uncertainty in those estimated activation times. But when we convert to velocities, we can again infer them, but we get much bigger uncertainties. Um, in, in, uh, as you might imagine, you know, you've got a surface you're estimating. If you then estimate the gradient of that surface, the uncertainty and the gradient is going to be much bigger. Okay. Okay, um, so the final step, we've, inf we've interpolated the activation times over the surface. We've used that to estimate conduction velocities on the surface. We now need to go from conduction velocities to parameters that we're gonna fit into our complex simulation model. So we're using something called the mitchell Schaefer model, okay, which captures conduction velocity and something I didn't talk about, restitution curves in five parameters. Okay. But that's for a single cell, if you like. So the conduction velocity through a small region of tissue. We then join lots of regions of tissues together into um, a model of the atrium, so an organ level model using uh, the monodomain equation. Okay, so this tells us how uh, the waves spread at each location. The mitchell shape model gives us the uh, velocity of each thing. So we're going to get five parameters that vary via location. So we've got a simulator, which we can think of as a black box that takes the spatially resolved parameters, theta, and you're going to predict activation time maps. And we want to go backwards to infer these parameters at each location. 
Okay. And once we've inferred those parameters, we can then answer the kind of questions that the surgeons want. Okay. So this is still work ongoing, so I'm not going to give much details here, uh, but we, we're taking a kind of very heuristic approach here. We've, we've got five surfaces to estimate from a really limited set of data. Yeah. So uh, the, the approach we're taking at the moment is for each location XI, we're going to infer the tissue properties at those locations using a simple kind of 1D tissue model and, a, and a, an, a, what's called an, an ABC or approximate Bayesian computation type approach. Yep. I'm not going to talk about that, but it's a very simple kind of lookup table. We've got a big table of simulations for the, this kind of 1D bit of tissue and anything that looks like our data, we're going to say, oh, that parameter is okay. okay. And it's going to allow us to estimate the parameters at each location. We're then interpolating these parameters across the atria. So we know this isn't the proper thing to do. You know, ideally, we'd want a, a, a full multivariate model of the um, spatially resolved tissue uh, parameters and to infer them you know, in, a, in a fully kind of Bayesian procedure, but we just can't do that. The, the simulation itself is too complicated. It takes five minutes to run. Okay. We've got millions of parameters. So, so the challenge really is to try and find kind of low dimensional regularities and to cope with the, uh, the expense of doing all this. What we're working towards is doing this in procedure. Yeah. A patient you know, gets knocked out um, uh, under anaesthetic, hearts put on their uh, wires uh, inserted, cathodes, um, cathodes inserted onto the surface of their heart. Okay, and we've got a small time window in which to take measurements, decide upon the treatment, and then to do the ablation. So we're nowhere near doing this yet, but what we're gonna to want to be able to do is to do this, uh, this training of this model in procedures. We're gonna have a 30 minute window in which to estimate these tissue properties from the measurements we take while the, the patient is under anesthetic. So we can do as much work as we like prior to the procedure. You know, we can do as much simulation as you like. You, you're gonna have the, the MRI, MRI scan of their heart. So we can do simulations on a patient specific heart, but we can only get the measurements that are gonna inform us of their tissue properties in that short 30 minute to an hour kind of window. And so any training we do, any estimation we do for these uh, parameters has got to be done very fast. So we're kind of exploring three approaches at the moment. This is my final slide. Um, kind of growing in complexity and sophistication um, and, or decreasing in hackiness, if you like. Um, the, the first is uh, the simplest. So this is kind of approximate Bayesian computation approach where we just, prior to procedure, pick a large number of theta's from our prior kind of beliefs about what theta's like to be, do the simulation for those theta's, for that kind of patient anatomy. And then once we get the measurements on that patient in the procedure, we're just gonna accept those theta's that give a reasonable match to the data. Okay, so that's gonna allow us to very quickly get a crude posterior. And all that work is done offline ahead of time. Okay, so that's the, the simplest, hackiest option. The next kind of option is, uh, a Gaussian process history matching type of thing. So if we, if we can train what's called a, an emulator, a Gaussian process emulator to approximate our simulator, we can do that training offline. Then in the, in the surgery, once we collect the data, we're gonna try and use our emulator rather than our simulator to find values of the parameter theta that give good matches to the data. Okay, so this is kind of a, a, a history matching type of approach. So that relies upon us finding a good emulator. The final approach, and kind of the most exciting, I think, but the most challenging is um, using these variational autoencoders, if um, there's anyone from machine learning here, uh, um, BAEs. Okay. So there, the idea is to try and get a, a variational posterior, uh, a variational approximation to our posterior. So we're going to approximate it by Gaussian with some mean M and some variance sigma. And there's uh, you know, procedures to go through to find these variational approximations. 
What the VAE does is try to train a neural network to predict the parameters of this variational approximation. So we're going to try and train a neural network that when given some data set D, predicts what the right mean is in this approximate posterior. So it's quite challenging, but if it works, that'd be really nice. If we could very quickly for any given data set, predict what the a variational posterior should be. So as you can imagine, all these methods are going to require upon reducing the dimension of theta and finding regularities somewhere. Okay, theta is a map, and we've got five maps over the surface of the heart. We can't we can't do that inference if this map is not smooth. So we're going to have to assume smoothness, regularity, a type of variation that is predictable in some way. And so it's about trying to find that regularity. Okay. So just to summarize then, it's a bit of a whirlwind kind of um, tour of what we're trying to do. So to summarize, I guess I, at the moment, the catheter ablation doesn't make use of mathematical models. There's lots of imaging and lots of people in the cath labs while this is happening and lots of predictions are being made, but there's no kind of complex modeling going in. What we're trying to think about is by having complex models that are patient specific, so digital twin to use the jargon, okay, can we improve patient outcomes? Can we use mathematical models of the atria to make better interventions? The challenges here are we've got a huge number of parameters. There's lots of uncertainties. The data are poor, the data are sparse. The challenge is can we kind of find re enough regularity in the problem to make this possible? Can we find strong enough prior distributions for a population that mean uh, the degrees of freedom are not too great. Okay. Can we do that? And the final thing is, can we do this in real time? Can we do this training in the 30 minute window of a uh, ablation procedure in order to influence what the surgeon does? Is that a feasible uh, outcome for this kind of technology or not? Okay. We're a long way from that, but that's kind of the questions we're trying to answer and working towards. Okay, thank you for listening. Um, sorry, it's a bit rambly, but I wanted to give you an overview of the project. Uh, that, was, that was really great. Thank, thank you, Richard. Um, just uh, give people a chance to write any, any comments in the chat or, or just feel free to unmute and uh, use your microphone. The only comment so far was, I think when you uh, mentioned Gaussian processes and said that uh, people uh, may know what they are. We had a comment saying that uh, Richard had no idea what it was. So <laughs> that, was, that was it so far. Um, Sorry, I, I missed guess, the chat. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, I guess it's always safest in these. Uh, oh, he said the explanation was fine though. So that's good. Yeah, it's always safest in these seminars. If you're not sure what they're going to, what people are going to know, it's usually safe to assume there's going to be some people who, who don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, just, yeah just think of Gaussian processes as regression models of functions. Okay. They generalize linear regression. Um, and they're kind of met one of the main workhorses in machine learning, I guess, and, and in statistics now. Um, uh, Jeff uh, has said Krieging in in geostats. I don't I don't understand that. But... Yes, so um, exactly. This, yeah, so Krieging or Krieging um, is what they're called in geostatistics. Uh, so people like Matheron uh, in the 50s and 60s discovered these processes um, and they're equivalent to Gaussian processes. So Krieging tends to be in terms of uh, non-distributional things. So the things as a mean squared error approximations, but it works out to be exactly the same as if you have a Gaussian process probabilistic model. So yeah, Krieging is another word for GPs. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um... I had a question, and I think this is probably more of a general thing about inverse modeling anyway, but how, well, particularly with Gaussian processes, because I, I guess there's a sort of uh, assumption that everything varies smoothly um, at some scale. It, is, it, is, there, is it problematic if there's um, sort of critical points or, or, or parameters where behavior 
uh, sort of discreetly changes when you change a parameter in the model. Um, so Gaussian processes don't assume smoothness, right? Uh, it's just that we tend to work with covariance functions that do. Um, so if you know there's a discontinuity somewhere, that's easy to build in. The problem is if, if you don't know um, these things, it, you know, if you if you don't know that your function is continuous anywhere, then you, you can give up modeling it. Um, you know, there, there's no point at all modeling it um, if it's if you don't have some kind of smooth assumption. So we will have the situation um, where there's scar tissue on the heart, okay, and that's fine because we can build that into these covariance functions. Okay, sorry, these basis expansion functions. So mm -hmm. one thing we might do is we, we, we can uh, infer fibrotic regions so that they're kind of regions that don't conduct electricity. And so we could have one basis function that was zeros or ones essentially to, 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 to mark out these scar lines and to say there is a discontinuity at these points and that's fine. Okay, so if, if these basis functions are discontinuous, our GP will be discontinuous. So we can build it in but only, you know, you can only estimate it. Well, it's hard to estimate it. So you need to know whether discontinuities mm. are. You can try, but it's going to be hopeless in this situation. I see, yeah. Can I uh, just say a comment? Um, yeah, there's a, also a question from Mike as well. I don't know if you've seen this, but go on. Um, um, Richard, the scenarios you, the inference scenarios you mentioned, the three at the end, uh, one of them was this history matching, right? So is, is it possible to validate that, that approach? You, you could validate how well you're doing, how much data you have in terms of, um, I'm just thinking you, this, is, this is the approach you could actually be validate if it's, gonna, if it's gonna, you can say something about if it's gonna work or not. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we are working um, synthetic, um, data at the moment, it's all simulated. Okay, so it gives us the opportunity to simulate things. We had had as part of this grant um, built in funding to collect data on 10 patients, but because of COVID, um, no one's doing that kind of experimentation uh, at the moment. So all that's been put on hold, but yes, um, we, we can hope to validate these things uh, by held out data and yeah. insemination. Is, is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I didn't know if 10 patients, 10 is probably, <laughs> and even you don't have those 10 patients or <laughs> in any case. <laughs> but I'm just saying that if you have enough data, you could, I mean, this approach definitely can work in, on, in during, the, during, during the surgery, for example, if you have enough evidence before that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the difficulty we always have is that you can validate it for a simulator, okay. but we, we have no way really of validating a simulation as being good for the patient. We can validate our procedures um, for models, but if, the, if the, the, the underlying mathematical model is poor, uh, that's a, a real problem for us. Um, and, and so in practice, the best we could ever hope for here is that we'd make predictions that if the surgeon then liked them and the surgeons are very experienced and they, they'll only do what they want to do, um but you know if you if you can offer them it'll be an, an an extra piece of information they could choose to use or not that's the, the best you could hope for i think um if, if yeah thanks uh, yeah sorry so we had a, a question in the chat i'm going to read it out even though i i don't fully understand it but um i'm sure you will it says do you think uncertainty can be predicted directly from the latent variables of the vae we don't know yet Okay, we hope so. Okay. Um, so I've implemented this kind of thing for simple ODE models. Okay. And you, you can get reasonable approximations to your posteriors for ODEs, but that's where you know, you're inferring one or two parameters. Here, here we've got one or two maps of parameters, well, sorry, five maps of parameters. So it's a, it's a hugely bigger problem. Um, but we'd have to reduce those maps with these kind of basis expansions to a small number of degrees of freedom, but we don't know whether this will work yet. Um, I'm skeptical, but 
you never know. Um, if, if you could do enough simulation, maybe we can, but it could be expensive in terms of computational simulation. Sorry, that's not an answer. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would just um, I keep it open for a couple of minutes in case anyone wants to ask another question. But I'll say thank you to everyone for coming now. Um, and uh, uh, thanks for your questions. I'm just giving people a chance to type. I'll keep recording until we finish the questions, just in case anyone has already popped off. Um, I guess the only the only question I, I had left, I, I can see, so I don't know much about machine learning in general, which mainly where this question comes from. I can see the benefit of going to a, an emulator rather than than ABC. Um, ABC just becomes a stupidly large uh, sort of space you have to cover, right, when, when you have enough parameters. Um, whereas GP emulators get you some way to covering that. What's the extra advantage from the machine learning over the GP emulator? Well, with the GP emulator, you'd still have to work out your posterior Right. You, you've got a, a forwards map from your parameter to your data, then in procedure, given a data, you have to then figure out all the thetas that um, work still. So there's still some computation to be done. So the VA, the VAE would be instantaneous, essentially. Um, right. It's just a single predict. Okay, you, you, you get the data, then you just do a single forward predict with your neural network. Uh, and it automatically tells you the posterior. So it's much faster. And then you can spend your time doing simulations with those, you know, with that uncertainty in theta to, to see what activation patterns occur. So okay. I think the advantage would be that it'd be much quicker. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Great. Okay, well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, so I'll just uh, yeah, anything left to do is thank you, Richard, for talking. It was a really, really interesting talk. And uh, yeah, this will be available for everyone to watch. I'll stop recording then. <laughs>